So we got a fair amount to chop up here. I have a feeling we're, we got to address the article uh, put out by The Athletic, the interview with Don Garber and, and the comments that he made, which uh, is it can go in a million directions. And I have no doubts that we're going to take it in a million directions because he made some statements that are somewhat uncharacteristic for the commissioner to to be as as unfiltered as as he was. Um, we got to talk about Philly getting dunked on, uh, putting getting six put up against them in Pachuca. That's a tough result, which to be fair, none of us saw coming. Uh, but then we also let's chat a little bit about some of the state of uh, youth soccer because there's uh, an awful lot of players that are coming up through the development of MLS academies that I think kind of references back to some of Garber's comments in what he was prioritizing or what they will be prioritizing maybe in the next decade uh, as we welcome the World Cup and welcome Copa America and all the other myriad of things that are, are going to accompany those things. And then we need to touch on <laughs> some of the wild happenings in the league, maybe Chicago, Montreal, and what that led into from Laurent Courtois and his comments about the referees, which is still an open can and has not been solved. We got a lot to discuss. Let's jump in. What's the toughest part about being a journeyman in a new city? Well, Gordo, you know this as well as I do. Being a journeyman in a new city or a city that you're staying in is always difficult. The uncertainty of the future. Are you going to stay? Are you going to go somewhere else? Back in 2020 with Nashville SC, when we had a brand new team, everyone coming to a new city, there was only one person that we trusted to get our real estate needs done. And that's Erin Mishu with Fikes Realty Group. She made everything perfect, flawless, seamless. We had absolutely no issues getting into our house here in Nashville. And all my teammates felt the same way. You can check Erin out at majorleague-realestate.com. Major League Journeyman reporting from a remote location for myself, Daniel Charles Gargan, uh, reporting live from Anna Maria, Florida. I'm giving up beach time for you guys, and there's not a ton of people that I would do this for, but the two of you, Mr. Dax McCarty and Mr. Alan Gordon, I am happy to be here. I hope you two are well. I wanted to kick this off, and why I was as excited to join this pod specifically was because of... The commissioner, Mr. Don Garber, came out and had an awful lot to say about the state of Major League Soccer, the state of the sport in North America. And Garber, for me, is 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 one of the most significant, if not the most significant figures in United States of American soccer uh, in the last 30 years. And I think that he, as long as he stays in the position that he is in, which I can't really imagine him leaving anytime soon, um, he will continue to be the face and chart the course of the transformation of soccer in this country. And he, when he speaks, I think that everyone listens for the most part, but I do think that his comments in a lot of ways get... Um, you know, they give he gives off the political, you know, the political spin, right? Like he doesn't really say what he needs to say or what we want him to say, not what he needs to say, what we want him to say or what we want to hear in terms of the specifics. But in this interview, for whatever reason, it did feel a bit less veiled and a bit more targeted and a bit more specific for a number of topics. Um, one of the, the biggest headlines in the athletic article um was him referencing soccer in the U.S. as the world's ATM, which I really, I'm still struggling. And part of this is like, I, I need some other perspective because I'm still struggling on how I'm supposed to feel about these things or what I, what they actually mean. Uh, Dax, you're you're smirking. Did what did what did you think when you heard him reference U.S. soccer? as a whole as the atm for the world what is yeah, what did that mean to you i don't i gotta say i, I i'm not quite sure I, we we agreed on this off camera guards that it's it's a little perplexing i mean you have to assume he means that in terms of our youth development and in terms of where the world is now i think scouting for young cheap players i think that's what he's referencing overall in terms of the talent that we're developing, our academies now, the infrastructure that we have at the youth level, um, it's all fantastic. And if you go and you want to try to sign a, a 13, 14, 15, 16-year-old from Brazil, 
I think that comes with a Brazilian tax, a heavier cost than maybe if you want to sign a young American kid, right? Who's 13, 14, 15 years old, and you can send your scouts over there. And, you know, you have this vast area of untapped potential in the United States of, uh, I think, so many people and so many kids playing this game where you go and try to get this Brazilian kid or this Argentinian kid, it's going to cost you, let's say, you know, $5 million, whereas you want to go, you know, try to sign this this young up-and-coming U.S. player who uh, has just so much raw potential and, and athletic ability, it'll probably cost you half that, if not, you know, a quarter of that. So I, I kind of think that that's where I'm leaning in terms of what he's referencing. I think if you re- read the, the article... A little bit more in depth, he goes into detail about how I think other countries and other people around the world are starting to look at MLS and the infrastructure in terms of how it's run, in terms of mm. uh, the the sustainability of the league, in terms of how um, you know owners are extremely strategic about their investment and where they want to invest dollars. And look, it's frustrating sometimes for us as players. I think it's really frustrating for fans because they want to see MLS explode onto the scene and start dropping billions of dollars into making MLS one of the biggest leagues in the world. But that's not how anything is going to work, right? We've seen Mm -hmm. this from Don in the past, and he said this type of stuff in the past where they are very methodically building this league, and it's a, it almost feels like a crawl at this point. But it's hard to argue with the results that we've seen in terms of academies, in terms of uh, these kids now in the academies have schooling provided for them, sometimes meals provided for them. They train at, at world-class facilities. Uh, MLS stadiums now, I think, are revered uh, around the world in terms of their – innovation in terms of you know how exciting it is to go to games so look i I think he's referencing all these things but the atm comment definitely threw me off a little bit but for me it's more to do with like the youth development aspect than anything else he talked a lot about i mean he talked a lot a lot like i said i mean there were there were some gems in here from and i can only imagine what was being said off camera um or or off the record so to speak um Gordo, he talks a bit about the commercial value of raising the commercial value in this country uh, of the sport in this country in ways where now it perhaps is the most valuable soccer market commercially commercially in the world. Still, this ATM comment, do you feel differently in what he was trying to characterize than what Dax said, or did you hear it the same way? I think it's a good perspective from Dax <clears throat> that I didn't consider. I just, I just don't it's it's really hard to to know exactly where he's going there. I think that's a good spin for Dax. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you can come to to the to the American market that's untapped. You like, can get him for like a little what, bit what is, the, what is the point of an ATM? You go there, you get money, right? Like, right, and that yeah, and that's there's, why there's an that's awful why, lot. You go ahead, Gordo. That's why it doesn't make sense to me because what Dax just said. That's what you go somewhere to to get money, right? And so for me, the the way that my mind was interpreting what he was saying was that we have the, we have the most money or money as in players to sell to get money, and I don't think that's necessarily the truth. We've not proven in in our in our market in our youth system that we are selling more more players and getting that money back than selling them overseas than other countries are i mean i think other countries have been doing it a a lot better than we have for a a long a long period of time and so that's why it doesn't make sense to me it's like for me it's more more about resale for me it's more about come get an an asset for really cheap right then you can turn around and sell this asset for more money right and that's where everybody wins right because you go and you know, you, you get a kid in a Dortmund Academy, you know, the U.S. soccer ecosystem, you know, gets paid on this kid, whatever it is, probably peanuts compared to the world market. And then, you know, he develops, let's call let's let's use Christian Pulisic as an example, right? He develops and then you sell him to for $70 million to Chelsea, right? Like, I think that's, that's kind of the direction he was heading. Right. And that's my point is because we've known for a long time, these clubs like Man U, uh, Man City, uh, go on and on and on. They, they, it's a, it's a numbers game for them. So, how many players have you played with that have the tag Man U or Man City or or all these clubs? Because they get these kids in bunches, and and typically they're going to African countries. And they're Richard Eckersley, do you remember that name? Cordo? 
Of course, yes. remember Eckersley. Richard Eckersley. Of course, of course. He, like, he came over with the tag of Ma- a Man United player, and and Nana, and Nana, Nana right? Him and Nana Bo- Boateng, who was you know who was a player that I played with in Colorado. But there, there's been a ton of them because yeah. they, they get these kids in in dr- in droves in droves. What what's that? Droves, droves. And then they, and then they, they, they're banking on getting one of those guys, right? And then so they bring him out and much. They're not doing that to American players. So how are we? How are we even close to being the ATM of the world? It's not even. It's yeah, not even I don't close. know, man. I I actually thought that it was a lot, uh, a lot broader than that because these Premier League clubs, these big Serie A clubs, have been coming to our country now for let's let's call it a decade. Let's say a decade, even though it's probably been longer. Let's say two decades, whatever. But there's there's money here, and I feel like that's what they are. That's what he's referencing. Uh, you got the Copa America coming here. You got every friendly, every international friendly wants to play each other in the states. You got the World Cup on its way here. You got an awful lot happening where these entities are coming looking to tap the ATM of of the soccer at, at the soccer spigot in this country, which continues to get wider and wider and wider, and it's becoming a lot more of a hose the the, he also talked about um and this wasn't necessarily just him this is also durbin todd durbin who has been the architect behind mls rules and structure and uh from the specific game um and the cap and all that stuff about nothing being off the table i think that that don said that specifically nothing is off the table in terms of the way that they maximize messi the way that they maximize the World Cup, the way that they maybe adjust these salary budgets. I think we, t- we touched on this maybe a couple months ago where he kind of hinted at the fact that they weren't making um, cap adjustments this winter, which everyone thought they were going to, and they were going to actually target a major overhaul. Dax, if you could pick one thing, let's say one thing that you think would happen or will happen, because we're all just shooting in the dark right now. What do you think is the one specific that they will change? Uh, I don't think they're going to change it, but they should change the salary cap. I think they should eliminate all the different mechanisms and just go to a minimum salary cap and a maximum, right? Like kind of like, uh, so like a floor, a floor and a ceiling, a floor and a ceiling, just Mm -hmm. let teams, let, let GMs do their jobs, let them do their jobs, take the training wheels off. Don't police what they're trying to do. Let them live and die by the decisions they make because, the salary cap mechanisms, I, I think that they were very necessary for MLS for 25 years. I think mm-hmm. I, I think Don Garber deserves credit for how well he has built MLS and how slowly he has built MLS. So it wasn't another cautionary tale. It wasn't another. I think. Yes, I mean, sir. to be fair, to to play devil's advocate here, Dax, I think that the league would rightfully push back on on calling the development of this league a crawl or being that it's slow. I mean, they've they've built a pretty significant infrastructure out in a relatively short amount of time. I think that's and more, that's and I that's coming that's, from that's coming no, from me, who gets frustrated just as often as you do about like, hey, just I, switch it up, come on. I think in terms of infrastructure, in terms of, you know, actual spending that owners are willing to, you know, put their money where their mouths are, they mm-hmm. have absolutely exploded MLS into relevancy for sure. But I'm talking mm-hmm. about more from a salary building standpoint. It has been a crawl, mm-hmm. right? You've added the DP rule when back. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And now we're how many years on from that? 15, 15 years on 18. yeah and i mean i don't have the specific numbers so, in so, front of me but what they are spending is is dramatically different than what they were spending I, it is i think but, it's been i think it's been a crawl for a, for american players but not american crawl, players that's for sure but, but also but for, not a crawl but also for, for fans teams. also for fans that want to see teams have more depth also for fans that want to see teams compete more regularly on the international stage and international competition against, you know, Liga MX teams who seemingly have unlimited funds and can go build teams that uh, don't have to prioritize different competitions. That was kind of more what I was referencing in terms of Mm -hmm. being a crawl with like the salary outlay, right? Because Mm -hmm. you have Maple Leaf, you know, Maple Leaf Sports Group, whatever that owns Toronto FC, they would go and, and they have their 3DP spots. We know they're willing to spend money. Right. Like that's Mm -hmm. the problem. But because of the salary rules and the mechanisms and you can only have, 
you can only use your under 22 DP spots if you use these DP spots. It's just, it's confusing, even for a player. I, I don't understand half the, I honestly don't understand half the rules. And I think Garber even admitted- well, the rule, Garber, Have you seen the rule book? It's, th it's literally this thick. I wouldn't even try to understand the rule book. I, I just, yeah. I, what I understand is that they've had to build a certain way. And it's felt, I think for a lot of people and a lot of fans, kind of like a crawl, when in the reality is somewhere in between. The league will say that mm -hmm. they've spent buckets of money and they've gotten somewhere faster than any other league has been able to get to, right? And uh -huh. so I think it's I uh -huh. think it's somewhere in between. I think it's somewhere in the middle. My point is take away all the salary mechanisms and take away all the different designations and just say, here's the minimum amount you, you can spend. If you want to spend more than that, here's the maximum you can spend. And we'll see how these GMs decide to build their rosters and we'll see where they prioritize. We'll see if Philly is still going to prioritize the Academy and Red Bull will still prioritize the Academy. And if Toronto mm -hmm. FC is still going to prioritize taking home run swings at superstars, right? Like in their primes, like I, it, it'll be interesting to see exactly how much more, you know, exciting the league can become if that happens. Now, I don't think it will, but I think it should. Gordo, let me give you let me give you Durbin's exact quote. We are looking at not just changes to the existing system, but what could the world look like if we have if we have a dramatic overhaul? If there's a bigger salary budget, for example, if we added more DPS, all the things that we're talking about. What if we had two quote super clubs? Nothing is off the table. What what do you what's on what's on the table for you that is uh, non negotiable? If you're in that room with Durbin and Garber, if the three of you are coming up with what MLS 4.0 structure looks like. What's a what's a must have for you? Well, if he's talking about two super clubs, then we we've already talked about it. it's club autonomy, you know, and it kind of goes into what Dax is saying. Dax is saying give the give the owners the power to spend money, and that's what people want. You know, and so well, have, it's, it's, has hasn't Major League Soccer had super clubs f since its existence? I mean, the um, league has no. been bending these rules for forever. Yeah, to, I mean, to whoever well, no, it credits. I, yes, they're yes. not. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's, That's the it's problem. Not, it's not, and and so they're almost protecting. How the can you owners. say it's not sustainable? It's been well, sustainable. They've been it's it, been growing like this. I'm yeah, saying the, the, the super club is be. not sustainable it's, under the current. You win, you win a couple championships. Everybody wants a everybody wants a raise. You can't give everybody a raise. So LAFC get has to get rid of uh, Chiki Palacios. They have to get rid of uh, Fall. Belonga. They have no, not Belonga, but they can't. They can't bring back Carlos Vela. Like <laughs> literally. Like, hey, but, no, but, what, general, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is they're 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 almost protecting the owners against themselves, and that's what the MLS has been built upon. Right. Sense mm -hmm. of existence, right? And so, if mm -hmm. you do open, if you do open up the floodgates, and you said, "All right, go spend what you want and build the best team you could possibly build." Look at these, look at these teams. You look at all the top teams: PSG, Man U. All these teams are in like half a billion dollars in debt because they just keep buying and buying and buying and buying and buying. And mm -hmm. and you know, it's an equity play. They're they they could sell and make that money back. However, they don't want our owners to start draining money and you know and kind of bleeding out to where they're because it's it's not a money maker for them you know these 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 franchises are not making money historically in the mls maybe maybe a couple uh less than a handful are, are actually profiting um year over year so they're they're i mean it's well, just that's, not, that's in cash but yes i hear what you're saying right. you know what i'm saying uh, i i mean to a degree I, I don't know. Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Um, he he happen. also says, "I'm not an owner. I want it to happen. I want to see a super club in the MLS." I'm. It's not. It's not me. I guess I, I would. I would. I would want to hear what an actual super club is because I feel like the Galaxy for the longest time were a super club, and New York Red Bull for the longest time was a super club because they were getting they were getting rules that weren't they weren't there or they were benefiting from from different tweaks that weren't quite there and nobody was slapping the wrist or they would just add another page, which is how the rule book ended up going from 17 pages to 717 that's, pages. That's because not a, they that's put not something super. in. Yeah, I, I I get it. That's why I'm saying what it, what that's, is an actual super club? What is the description? Because no, I feel like uh, you can't be a super club and also have Dan Gargan and Alan Gordon on your roster. All right, <laughs> no, Dax, that is that is disrespectful. Dax. That is that we were into oh the parts. Dude. Hey, wow. 
No, all it's, it is. It can't. It, it, it just. It can't happen. It can't happen. Oh, You're not talking about the on your roster. Dex, that hurt. That hurts, man. That hurts. I what take we have full in the MLS, to that. We have. We have. It comes from a place of love, guys. We have a <laughs> Sam Sosa and a Mark McGuire. Yes. Okay, we have a Sam Sosa and a Mark McGuire. So that they are okay. willing to say. I know you're doing steroids and we're going to actually right. provide them to you. Galaxy, Red Bulls or whoever it is that yeah. will push this club and we won't say anything because. Right. And then are, we'll push the steroids out to the rest of the league so that they don't get upset. I, I would, yeah. I would, if we took a poll of all of the GMs in the league from 2000 and 2000 until 2020, I bet that, the overwhelming majority of them would say that there were rules for most, but not for all. Yeah. 100%. That's where I'm saying, okay, so what is this super club? Either way, uh, do I think we'll see a super club? No, I don't think, I don't think that's on. I don't think that's realistic. Are we seeing one now? I mean. In who? In Miami? Seen... They're trying, they're trying. In Miami. No, I think that they're a further iteration of the, what is the super club, which is basically right. guys just make making the rules work for them and right. and getting away with it because i think that they tried that like the hold on let's re let's remember how sanctioned. long ago was this how long ago was this that miami got sanctioned they were supposed to not compete and now they're the best team in the league with the best players in the league and there doesn't seem like there's a pipeline that is getting closed off anytime soon so like I, I don't know. It, it yeah, just, when it when seems... did the sanctions go away? When Messi showed yeah, up? Yeah, where 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 <laughs> were the sanctions? Whoa. The only one that got the only one that got hurt in this is Paul McDonough, who is now who got yanked out of there. And I don't know. It just seems it seems a little disingenuous that idea. I do love the idea, though, that they are actually looking at everything and revamping the way that. It, and and to your point, Dax, about it being a crawl. Durbin goes out and says specifically, this is going to be a brisk process for change, which is pretty wild. Also references specifically the middle or the end of this year. They have to be prepared for Copa America. They have to be prepared for the World Cup. And then they have to be prepared, to your point, to be able to sell players after all these things and after this country is crawling with scouts and eyeballs that, that are going to be on this for game. Me, for me, we can move on after this, but the, the 2026 World Cup is the tipping point for, I think, where you're going to see MLS 5.0 or whatever you want to call it, right? Like, Sure. I just think that there's going to be, if you guys remember 94, I mean, nobody gave a shit about soccer and the World Cup came and then it was all of a sudden sold out stadiums everywhere. Like mm -hmm. now from where we were then to where we are now, right, with MLS, there, there's going to be so much momentum uh, coming into that World Cup. And especially if our men's national team does well, which fingers crossed, hopefully they will do well. I, I just, it's going to be rocket fuel on something that's already on an upward trajectory. And I, I hope it's not just beneficial for MLS. I hope it's beneficial for every league in the U.S., right? Yeah. Because yeah. the better the USL is, the better MLS is going to be, right? I mean, the more competitive that all these different leagues are throughout the U.S. soccer ecosystem, the better off soccer in this country is going to be. So I, I just think- I tell you what, I don't see, I don't see, <laughs> I don't see Don or Major League Soccer doing anything that they can to help out the USL. They, no, they did, won't. Did you, did they you, don't you, care. His comments, his yeah, comments yeah, about won't. MLS Next Pro, did you see those comments? These are kids, he's talking about Kevin Sullivan, the kid in Philly that's 14 years old that has been playing like three, four, five years up on the national team, playing well above his age in the Philadelphia Union's academy setup. I think he actually went down to the first team's um, spring training, yeah, preseason. Um, and I, I've seen I've seen the kid play uh, in clips. I've seen the kid play in some of his games. It's pretty insane what he can do with a ball for the ages that he was doing. I mean, they were talking about this kid like four years ago when he was 10, nine and 10 years old and playing with the U15s, like doing wild things. Um, but Garber specifically says, it, talking about wanting that kid to be able to play in the US, not sell him. Like, can we get our league to a point where these kids don't want to go to Europe, which is a, a major shift of thinking from where we were two, three years ago about building the academy system. And now we might be sitting on a kid that I think news came out maybe today, yesterday, about him signing with Man City, but producing talents. And, and he's been, I think, linked to Dortmund for a while. But anyway, 
he talks, Garber talks about MLS Next Pro. I don't know where these kids would be playing if not for what MLS Next Pro has offered them. I don't know what they would be doing because they certainly wouldn't be playing soccer, not in America. As in, like, there is an awful lot of options to be playing soccer for these kids, USL being, I think, the, the top uh, outside of, of MLS. And he just directly threw all of that under the bus. But there's been some contention, right? I mean, there's been some contention with the U.S. Open Cup, with the USL, with an awful lot around that centers around MLS, which is certainly the mid the midpoint of the ecosystem. But there's an awful lot to to level up there, and I don't think that MLS is. It, it seems like they are they have taken a hard left on supporting anything other than their own properties. Yep, that seems like a fair point. There's not much to add there. What do you what do you feel like uh, in terms of like this this cave and Sullivan issue and, and in terms of like because Dax you talked specifically about developing talent being the, like the big one does this point to the U S Philly Union but the U S now being a talent production center or we're still at the very beginning stages of this we are at the beginning stages of it but yes there is already proof of concept right? Like there, there's already proof that the U S is a gold mine for like untapped potential and, and kids that are, I think, hyper talented, hyper athletic kids who are going to be poached from world-class clubs. Right. And mm-hmm. let's be honest, 95% of kids that come through MLS academies, again, of those kids, five, 10% are actually going to make it and be successful pros. In my opinion, I still think that those numbers are going to be bared out because that's how it is in the world's game in the most competitive sports in the world. That's just, it's just a numbers game. There's just not enough Mm -hmm. contracts and not enough teams for all these kids to play for. But of those, you know, of those kids that do end up turning pro, most of them, I, I think will sign their first contracts as a homegrown contract with the club that they want to play for this kid who we're talking about, Kevin Sullivan, I, I haven't seen him play, but I have heard about him. Right. Like, I, I don't know if you've seen him play, Dan, like he's, it's, it's, it's impressive. He's, yeah, it's past impressive. But, but, but again, someone like that is an aggressive outlier. That is not sure. normal. So, so right. for him and his family, his options are, you pick what club you want to go to and that club probably will make a plan for you and buy you, or I don't know how it works with 14, 15 year olds, but they will have a plan for you and they will sign you and you will be making big money by the time you're 18, 19, 20 years old. You're going to go out on loan a few times. The decision for me, it always comes down to the kid, right? Like what does, what there is no linear, there's no right or wrong answer to a path of development. It's there's just not, you can't convince me. Jordan Morris had the opportunity to go overseas when he was really young. He decided that the path for him was going to be to sign a homegrown contract in Seattle, be close to his friends, be close to his family. And he has become a superstar in MLS for the Seattle Sounders. And he's making great money. And, you know, he's represented the U S national team. Now you'll have people that will argue he didn't develop his full potential. He should have gone over sure. to Bremen or to Germany, and he could have been a much better player. That's fine, and that may be true, but who knows? Landon Donovan, one of the best players the U.S. has ever produced, did that, and he didn't like it. And he was a shell of himself over there, and it wasn't good for him. Kevin Sullivan, Christian Pulisic, is a great example of someone who tested himself. He went over there, and he has become a fantastic player, a superstar in every sense of the word, and it worked out for him. There is no right or wrong answer. The path to development mm. is wholly dependent on the kid and what his mentality is and what his mindset is. So he's the outlier, right? Like I think MLS is still really, really early to be saying every single kid who's good enough to play professional soccer should be signing an MLS. Well, that's just not true because sure. a kid like this can go over to Man City or Real Madrid or Barcelona or Borussia Dortmund or whatever because he thinks he's going to get better games. He thinks he's going to get better coaching, which let's be honest, that might be true. Like there's mm-hmm. there's a lot of proof that that is true, but also it doesn't necessarily make sense for every kid. So for me, it's I still think, balanced. Yeah. The, M- the MLS is still at its infancy in terms of being able to keep a kid like that in the ecosystem, but he's the outlier. Yeah. Most kids that yeah. are good enough to turn sign pro contracts at 16, 17, 18, they're not going to want to go over to Europe and be away from their friends and their family. Let's 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 consider who we're talking about here. We're talking about children, right? Yeah. And so for the no, and you guys know them, this. It's going to be better for them to stay here. 
I, you go, you guys know, I run a, a youth club in St. Louis, Lou Fuse Athletic. And I think that one of the things I've been to some of these MLS next fests, right? Like the, the next level tournaments with all the Academy kids. So I, I've actually watched it. I've seen it. We've been developing players and developing teams now for a few years. Um, and I, what I see, I still think that there is a major gap in between 16 to 22 in terms of the level of play on a consistent basis. I think that what this country has done from maybe from 10 to 16 has gotten pretty good and has definitely increased the level. But there's still that transitional stage where you go from being a uh, an older kid to a young man to an actual pro. Gordo, I know that you've now been around some of these events and been around some of this play where where do you see it trending do you see it trending in a in a positive direction or do you think that we're kind of saturated with where we're at because there are so many variables that come into play um yeah a little of both i think it's super saturated um i think the i think the structure is questionable how how of, of the youth of the youth development system um i think that there's very I think it's become a money grab in a lot of ways. So for for a lot of these kids, because listen, from the time they're 10 now, they're going super serious, very expensive. So we're losing a lot of our inner city kids that could be the ones that have the most talent. It's really become who's, whose parents have the resources to get them to into these teams and travel around the country and kind of it's become very political right and then they get mm -hmm. on these teams because they're willing to do that and these clubs want the the money because that's that's how they're surviving and that's how they're making profit and so then you just get these kids in this system and like you said they get to a certain place and they are maybe they aren't the ones that were going to be the extreme talents we're losing a lot of the of the kids that don't have the resources to get the get the get the coaching and get the exposure that they should need. So I think that there is a huge gap and there's a huge problem with youth sports today. I really do. I just don't think there's enough avenues for kids um, that don't have don't have the funds and the means to get on these teams. And Guards, let me yeah, let, let me ask you let me ask both of you a question because I had this conversation the other day in the meal room, and I'm not I'm not going to say with who, but it was with one say of with my who. say with who it was with say one with of who. my it was with one of my current teammates who has a few older kids, and he uh, he was just talking about coaching in in the U.S. in general in terms of youth coaching. Mm -hmm. Development. So, is this are, guy, uh, is this guy run, an American? Is this you, guy run, American? you run a soccer club. This isn't 21 questions, Gordo. All right. Okay. All right. All right. <laughs> you, go, guards, you run a youth soccer club. Gordo, yes. you are a coach. I'm coaching. Yeah, you're yeah. a coach, right? I'm, coaching. I'm not going to question your coaching credential, cr credentials after 20 years of professional playing experience. But in general, I'm, I'm yep. speaking out of a place of ignorance here because I just don't know. My kids aren't old enough yet. I haven't delved into the sports scene. Some mm -hmm. things that I hear is that the youth coaching in this country is a disgrace and it's an abomination. And kind of like to Gordo, what Gordo was saying, kind of to his point, the best coaches, they want to get paid and it costs money to pay these guys. And the pay to play model, nothing, no, no great coaches want to coach for free. So I'm asking you guys, is there a balance to be had there? Is the coat is youth coaching a massive problem in this country? Because to me, it's not a talent issue. We are getting more kids playing soccer every year. There's talent everywhere in this country, but is that talent being developed properly? And I don't just mean on the field. I mean, as an individual, right? As, as a, as a young adolescent, as a child, as a mm -hmm. kid, like, are we trying to foster an environment where we use athletics to not just develop a robot, but to develop a good person, to develop a good human being. Like I, I don't really think the investment into the kid is there. If that's if I'm hearing that correctly, and one of my teammates said, like, listen, I, one of my one of my kids had one of the worst coaches I've ever seen in my entire life, and and you know I didn't want to I didn't want to to say anything right away because of the position that I was in. I wanted my kid to be able to take on board whatever was happening. And then after the season was over, I wanted to ask him how he felt about it, uh, you know, what the situation was. And then I gave my opinion, right? And, mm -hmm. and, you know, now he knows what a good coach looks like because of all the things that I said that I saw that wasn't appropriate that was happening. So I'm kind of like, you know, guards, you, I, what what are the, you run a really big club, Lou Foos in, in yep. St. Louis. I mean, 
what are the credentials that you use to bring coaching on? And is that what points of emphasis do you use? And I don't really want to get into this, but like yeah. the pay to play model, you, you can't just have great coaches coaching for free. Right. I mean, no, you put can't. Food on the table. So for me, it's like, I, I see what your point is, Gordo, but like, where's the balance and is there a balance mm. to be had? Is there a solution to be had so we can get the coaching at the youth level on par with professional level, but also more affordable. And, and so it makes yeah, sense. So I, I think that this is probably a, uh, an entire episode that we right. should probably hit on and chop this up. But I will I will touch on my perspective now. I've been in this industry um, for eight years. And I think to Gordo's point, there is an awful lot that is still wrong with it just like any other business or just like any other development. Like you are, you are now at the very front end of what I would envision to be a longer term process of incorporating all of the variables that you're saying. What we focus on is giving, um, giving amateurs an opportunity to step in to coach. So whether that's parents or whether that's um, people that are looking for careers that want to stay in the sport, that want to give back players that have come through our club that are now in college or post-college and want to get into coaching. But one of the big pieces that we focus on is education while you're coaching. So we do right. coaches education once a week for all of our staff and all of our coaches and all of our full-time. Now there's levels to this stuff, right? So like we have a licensed coaches. We have internationally licensed coaches. We have B, C, D, grassroots, all of it um, because of the scale that we're at. But I, you know, I think it, it's almost like a, a chicken and the egg scenario where what, what comes first? Do you have, you have, this is, um, you know, do you, do you pay for everything? Or do you go back to the place where we didn't have the resources, we didn't have the facilities, we didn't have the higher level coaching, we didn't have all this stuff that costs a lot of money and it produced players like myself and like Alan and maybe Dax was on the tail end of that. I mean, you could go back to like the way that we grew up. We didn't have, we didn't even play on grass. We played on dirt. We turned played on, on mud that had frozen over through spikes because it was repetitive, right? And you could point to plenty of coaches there that were horrific coaches that were like way over the line in so many different ways, but it's a different time. And I think the way that we look at it, we have a unique opportunity to have kids on a field without a screen, without their parents hovering over their shoulders, without a, a lot of different things that are prevalent in today's society that weren't prevalent when we were coming up through the ranks. And what I also think is, um, there is actually a lot more avenues for kids to play sports than there ever were. I mean, think about just with us, we have over 200 competitive teams that want the experience of being on a competitive team, right? When I was growing up, there was probably maybe 15 teams in an age group of Which, who you would play. You'd play this town over here. You'd play this town over here. You play this, but that goes to the point of the growth of the sport more so than anything else. There are literally it, soccer is the biggest sport in this country. It was not the biggest sport in the country when we were growing up. We're talking about a hundred X growth times a hundred X growth times a hundred X growth of, and that's every family that wants to play. Now is every family a Caven Sullivan? Absolutely not. We have Baggio Hasidic, a former teammate of both of ours, Gordo overseas and coaches in our top platform coaches, our MLS next kids. Is a is a an A licensed coach is a UEFA badge coach also has the amount of experience that he has. Does he have the ability to to lead our youth at those age groups? In my opinion, absolutely. And in my opinion, it's probably almost overboard for some of the kids that he is developing. I don't think that professional players in this country are gonna are gonna develop at a different rate. I still think that we're gonna have that 5% that goes on to be in a position to then ultimately be the ones that, that get picked up. But what I will say in seeing this day in and day out is we are producing better soccer players that are genuinely a billion times better than any of us were at any point in our development. And I'm talking about as a 25 year old, as a 30 year old, the, just the comprehension of the 13 year olds that we have that are in our club is crazy. And we are um, probably a middle level, maybe upper middle level club, amateur club in this country. You have the MLS clubs that are, that are the tops of the tops because of, of a number of variables that, that I think that 
help them. Um, and then you have a layer of amateur clubs that just do it consistently because of another, you know, group of variables that, that kind of help support that. But to your point, there is an awful lot that still needs to be adjusted. That still needs to change. That still needs to take an impact. But Gordo, I don't know if I would agree with what you're saying in terms of like inner city kids not having the opportunities because it's not like any inner city kids were playing soccer 20 years ago. It just, it's a sport that doesn't, hasn't necessarily gotten there, I think. And, and part of that is, well, don't you think think that's a a problem? I'm not saying it's not a problem. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's not any different. I don't think it's any different than what it's been. I think that we still need to address it. Like I've, like I said, I think that there's a number of things within this developmental system that need to get addressed. That's definitely one of them. Yeah. Let me just address this. And this is where I think I'm talking about the problem. Okay. And the inner city kids. Okay. So with, when you said we have 200 competitive teams, right? Mm -hmm. That is a problem to me. That's a problem because on my son's, my youngest son's in his age, we are probably the smallest club in Colorado. One of them. We're a very small club. I didn't, I haven't taken my kids and gone to the Rapids or these other big clubs because I'm fine. They, they, they're fine yep. where they are. Yep. His, his age in our small club, they have seven competitive club teams. Mm-hmm. If you went out and watched team five, team four, team three, through seven, you would say there's no reason, there's no way, there's no reason that these parents need to be paying $2,000 per year just for club fees plus this, that, and this, and that, and the other. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what that does is it completely sucks out all the competitive, um, all the, it, it, it eliminates your rec program. So what it should be is back when we were playing, you had to earn on your way, your way onto a club team, right? And that mm-hmm. way, your rec, your rec league can be very competitive. They can go into it. It's more affordable for, for families to get some competition. Now there's zero competition. And that's where I think that's, you're talking about that's in the rec the leagues. In the rec leagues, there's no rec leagues. There's no, so we, every we have wants our to own say, rec league. We have our own, and I'm, I'm just speaking from, from our club yeah. in particular, but what I that's will just say, what is, I see. There's a ton of of on ramps here that cost relatively nothing. Now, here's the, to to your point specifically about an age group having like a number of competitive teams because I don't think you're you're wrong in terms of the the level of teams once you get further down in the age group, right? But here's here's the difference, and here's the here's the difference how we look at it. Those kids want that experience they want the experience of feeling like they are on a competitive team are they on the top team they're not do they know they're not on the top team they do does the top team know who the top team is they do as well the difference is at least how we try to address it or how we try to try to position it is these kids want to feel like they get to travel to see other clubs. They want to feel like they go to out of town tournaments. They want to feel like they participate in a club environment on our facility, which has 10 lit turf fields and has weight training and has whatever. I guess the the moral of the story is they still want to feel like they are taking steps in their development as well and not necessarily being um, closed off from those opportunities because of their physical ability, because their physical ability doesn't match up to the top kids. And that's something that we, as Lufus Athletic, pride ourselves on, is we give every resource that we have, we offer to every kid in the club. So if it's speed and conditioning, if it's weight training, if it's this, if it's that, if it's this, everybody has the same things. And that's not the best kid, it's not the worst kid, it's all across the board. So I I think you're right. It's not easy. It's it really is a tough issue. And it's it, everything. I, I feel like I sit on I both sides a, of the there's fence. There's not a perfect solution to any of this. There's well, not, right. There's and not. I feel pretty get, comfortable in arguing a, both unless, sides of it. Yeah. Right. Unless you get a billionaire coming in and saying, you know what? I'm going to provide grants to 100,000 inner city kids in all these different cities and they can go and, and play at whatever club they want. Like it's just. But yeah. see, here's your here's your point to your point right there, Dax. This is this is an interesting piece of this because that's essentially what Major League Soccer did. They said, you know what? 
we're going to come in and we're going to pay for all these academies and we're going to put these academies are free. So major league soccer academies, if you get to that point, it's free. How many black kids do you see in those academies? Right. I don't know. Not a ton. It's still not really a ton of the sport. It's just not. And I, I, what I think it is ultimately is because it doesn't happen in their communities, in the, in the lower income communities, you don't see the type of infrastructure that's there. So I, I, that, that is apparent in other places. That's a point of emphasis for us. We, we want to get out of the space that we're in. I'm talking about physical geographic location and get into other spaces, yeah. but it's hard. It is genuinely for difficult sure. because it for costs sure. millions of dollars, yeah. millions, double digit millions to get anywhere to, right. to build anything. And that's where some of this stuff with like, what I think why European clubs are, are, are still producing at a faster clip at a, a more efficient clip is because it goes back to the way that I don't want to call them civilizations, but like these towns were built with a soccer field and there it is. And that's where you go. And that's what you do. Right. And it's, yeah. it's period end of story. Well, that's it, it, it makes have, it, have you seen what, have you seen what Kyle Martino's doing, you know, kind of just yeah, soccer yeah, on yeah, the streets. Awesome. that's that it's a, it's a, it's an awesome movement. If you haven't checked, if you haven't, if you haven't checked it out, do you, you guys know what it's called? Over under. Um, I think it's called. What is it? Golfer maybe. Golfer in the over under play. Yeah, it, it, it's it's fantastic. It's really just what you said, guards. Is taking these these basketball courts that because there's basketball courts in every city, right? The inner city, and turning them into soccer fields and, and allowing people just to go out and play. You know, we could we you you said it, man. We we could spend three episodes on this. You know, I don't think we you need could. to go into it anymore. But the only thing that I want to touch on, Dax, is yes, I think we do have a coaching problem because it's it's hard to pay good coaches. When I came out when I came out of the league, I was looking for a job, and as I was like, okay, I'll go kind of as I'm finding my next move. You know, I'll go coach. They the Rapids youth program. They offered me thirty five thousand dollars to coach, like three teams and wow. Jeb Brofsky, who was also an ex player, he was doing the same thing. He was making that amount of money. And he was, he said he's in, he's coaching from seven to seven. And he's like, my wife mm-hmm. literally hates me because yeah. I'm making no money and I'm on the field all day. So it's, it's a really tough, it's a tough, issue. Sell. Yeah. It's a tough sell for, for guys who have experience and good coaches. That's a tough for sure. Sell. Yeah. So we, we it is. There's there's a challenge. There's a challenge in any department of whichever, you know, can you want to open up. There are challenges associated with it, but it is it is a big responsibility because it does it will affect and it does affect uh, our youth, which I think is the point of all of this. Right. Um, To answer you specifically, Dax, I think that the coaching is not atrocious. I don't think I think the coaching is actually pretty good across the board, but you still get really bad coaches. Like that's that's you're not going to miss that ever. Um, exactly. Better than what I had, you know. I had a couple college kids who were coming hung over to train me and the boys every, that's true. every couple days. I, I at some point on this pod I'm going to have to go into my FC Copa stories which are legendary. We need to have a pod my, dedicated just to story time. This is what I was talking to you guys about, but that's for another year. Gordo, we live in crazy times right now. What are things looking like in the real estate market? Oh, Dax, you know that rates are always going to be the best with Synergy One Lending. And those are always going to fluctuate. But one thing that never fluctuates, that's the service you get with Erin from Bikes Realty Group. She is the number one agent I will refer all my clients to. She handles all the obstacles up front, really takes the stress out of any transaction and move that you have. Check out my girl, Erin Mishu with Fikes Realty Group at majorleague-realestate.com. All right. So I do want to recap a couple of different things, though. One being the the six that Pachuca put on Philly. We all picked Philly as one of the three teams of the three games to be the one with the most realistic opportunity to get out of the Champions Cup. And they got their head handed to them. I was shocked. I know that you two were shocked. They come back and have a draw against Austin, um, 2-2. That seems like an emotional response more so than anything else, being you know absolutely smacked against Pachuca and having to come back and play a team that you're not going to really be prepared for. Dax, you kind of said you you had maybe a, a little bit more of a critical opinion of Philly. Are, are you do you feel like they're on the decline or do you feel like they're hitting a rough patch or what are you seeing from from your eye? 
I don't think they're on the decline. I think they're in a rough patch right now. I think there's a little bit of a changing of the guard happening in Philly. Um, mm-hmm. I think we've seen big minutes played from some really good young players, uh, guys like Quinn Sullivan, guys like um, Jack McGlynn, right? Yep. Uh, yep. The, the issue for me is defensively, they are a shell of what they used to be. And I, that, yeah. I'm not just saying that because they got six hung on them. I'm saying that because of even an MLS no. You're right. I mean, they haven't been great over they're, the, beginning, they're, they're of the, not the defending, beginning of the season. They're, they're they're not defending in the way that I think they they have been in the past. And like, let's look at some facts here. Like Alejandro Bedoya, massive part of their success the last couple of years. He's getting older. He's not playing as many minutes as he used to. A couple of young guys come in. Jack McGlynn, what a wonderful player to watch. Guy with a wand of a left foot. I mean, is he the most mobile guy? Do you want to really play him in in a diamond midfield where, you know, he's going to have to cover a ton of ground, get forward, get back, shuttle side to side? I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't seen enough of him physically to see if that's a role that he's really going to thrive in. But for me, it's like Gleznes, Jack Elliott, Damian Lowe. Like, for me, th- they're just not putting out the fires that they used to put out. I mean, Jim mm-hmm. Curtin has trusted these guys – to defend 1v1 in 1v1 situations almost constantly. It's the same with Andre Blake, right? Like he is mm-hmm. starting to show a little bit of signs of like he's not making the routine saves that he used to make, but also the big flashy saves that have kept this team in games for you know years now, right? And so um, for me, I, I think it's a rough patch. I, I think they will come out of it. I still think they're going to be extremely competitive in the Eastern Conference. But yeah, it's – there are some cracks that are beginning to show and I'll be curious to see if Jim Curtin, if he tweaks anything, if he tweaks the formation a little bit, maybe he goes to play more three at the back with, with three center backs on the field to shore up their defense a little bit more. I mean, I, I would be curious to see, you know, what Jim is going to do. Cause I think this is probably along with like his first year or two at Philly, this is absolutely probably his most trying time as a coach at this moment. So I, I mean, I think we all three agree that he's a wonderful coach I think he'll be able to figure it out. But, yeah, it's been very, very interesting to see Philly struggle. Philly Philly struggled on the weekend. Um, Gordo, any other results that stuck out to you on the weekend as almost su- either surprising or or trending in the direction that we had talked about? So, uh, let me give you a couple of the scores. Um, Colorado took a, a tie off of Seattle in Seattle. That's a bit concerning. If you're a Seattle fan, if you're Colorado, it's coming off of a great result against Salt Lake in Salt Lake. Um, Miami picks up another win. Not a shock. Columbus smacks Red Bull 3-0. Red Bull had a red card, but still you hung three on Red Bull. That's that's pretty good. Uh, Columbus seems to be in a good spot. Cushing in New York City maybe saves his job. Did you Minnesota guys see the clips of that? LAFC. Minnesota's yeah, on Minnesota Minnesota over LAFC. Uh, Minnesota is one of those teams I, I said I, I did like. Um, I like a bunch of their players, and they do f- seem like they're finding results, um, which I think is always a good hallmark of a good team is when, you know, maybe you're not in the best form or you got some issues, but you're still picking up results. They're doing that. Um, yeah, a few, a few for me is just, you know, I mean, L.A. versus St. Louis. L.A., L.A. Did you see any of that game? Yeah. I did. LA, LA. I watched. I didn't see the whole game. Did you see the whole game? I I saw the last twenty five minutes, maybe twenty yeah. twenty five minutes, and yeah, I caught the second. You half. saw the first half. You saw the first half. Okay, then you'll have to add some color to what I saw because I saw the last twenty five minutes of the game, and the Galaxy absolutely <laughs> smashed St. Louis in terms of possession, chances, everything. I I was I had not seen St. Louis picked apart like the galaxy picked them apart. I also can honestly say that I haven't seen the galaxy play that good of football maybe in five years. And almost years. lost the game. And almost, and almost lost, lost the game. game. Yeah. yeah. Dax, what was the rest of the game like? What was the first half like? Galaxy were really good. Galaxy they were, really, were really good. Okay, it, so it was a full it, 90 they played, performance. They played right through St. Louis's pressure. But, guys, this is what we've talked about with the Galaxy and Greg Vanny teams in the past. They have always been good soccer teams. They've just yeah, they, well, either, they all that's either, that's not that's not true because Greg Vanny has not put out good soccer teams over the past few I'm years. Talking not, about, I, I don't I'm, I'm not talking about from a results perspective. I'm talking about from an aesthetic perspective. They play beautiful. Yeah, I, I don't think that they've played beautiful soccer over the past few years. What I, I saw I them disagree. play this past I, weekend I, I, I was disagree. impressive. I, dis- I, I disagree with you with extreme prejudice. They have always Come played on. good soccer. Oh, they've always played good soccer, but they haven't that's been able a, to score. And they've they've kept <laughs> They've literally conceded 100 goals. 
They have. <laughs> yeah, they can see too much. And we always knew their background I'm, has a problem. Are you guys, are, do you, take the earwax out, Gordo. I'm <laughs> telling you guys, the results haven't been there to match how they have played. They've tried yeah, but they to weren't play, like, playing great them. soccer. Did you but watch they them weren't the playing great season? soccer. They, 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 they had great. moments. I'm not saying that they didn't have moments, but they, they also were not soccer. playing great now, soccer. Did we playing... not talk about at the beginning of last year when we first started this ridiculous podcast? Did we not talk about how they had one of the best midfields in MLS? How Yeah, Brugman, but then they started playing. How Brugman and, and Mark <laughs> Delgado and Ricky Pooge were fantastic. And then Brugman got injured and... Uh, listen, I'm not saying it's all Vanny's fault. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying I'm that telling the you guys, team yeah, yeah, yeah. has I'm, not been good. It's not I, always been fine. good. Again, they, the team fine. hasn't been good, but they've played aesthetically <laughs> pleasing soccer. We will have a few fans that I think at least will at least be able to compute what's happening because I know I'm talking okay. about I know what you're saying. Slower in, guys in a, I know Jovalich, what you're saying. Gordo, let's, let's turn this back on you saying Jovalich. Yeah, let's because I did say Jovalich that this guy four, was going to score goals. Jovalich has four goals in four games, so you look like a moron. I just want that to be noted. Uh, why are you? Why do you always come back so hard? You're so defensive. I, I, I'm just saying. Do you, do you want so to try defensive. to do that or what? I, I take it back. He can score oh, goals. Oh, you take it back. Good. He can score I goals. I take it back. Let me, let me that make was, a, that was a good let me one. make my point. How about – LA Did Donovan, anybody see this? Listen, 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 no, 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 no. Let's hold on. Let's move but, on. No, hold on. Hold on. I don't want to move past Jovalik. So he okay. is like our ex-Chicago teammate. That's who he is. Who? That's who he is. I forget who? his name. What, what was his name? Which one? Nemanja. 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 Nikolic. So, so, dude, he's, he can score goals, but did ba- did Basti love playing with him? You no, tell he me. didn't. No, he didn't. A lot of guys didn't because he didn't make the team better. He didn't make the team better. He scored goals. Scoring goals which, makes the team better. What are you okay, talking about? Okay, but but no, in in a 90 minute game, you you can get a forward and all I was saying, I I I, I like the guy. I like the guy. He's always come in, he's come in as a super sub, he's just scored goals. I I don't mind him, okay? But I'm saying for the Galaxy to to be a top a top team in this league i felt like they needed a number nine that was going to do other things than just score goals if you watch them oh, on, a, yeah. on a 90 minute I hate those nines minute. that just score goals i'm done i'm done <laughs> click it off i'm click it off be dangerous you're almost, you're almost making my point for me i'm not almost making yes you are no, saying oh they need a play they need a player who can contribute more than just scoring goals they want to play beautiful football and aesthetically pleasing football like no they've got a nine and score goals goals yes like they needed that so they have uh, i their team their team is much better and Great. they've my added pieces this, around ours. jovelich and he scores this. they Please still needed a 95th minute equalizer to get anything yeah. to the game I know. I loved yeah. it. I loved the guy. Which was crazy. Which was crazy. Defensively, they are, there are still question marks defensively. That was my general point, okay? okay. They play beautiful Fine. football. They play great soccer. It's really pleasing on the eye. They're going to have great possession. Ricky <laughs> Pooge is going to dribble through the midfield, whatever. Like, yeah, it's great. They are, still, we tell- they, are still, they are still weak at the back. And we could go into one more result, Gargs, about a team that's the exact opposite. And yeah. That's, that's the Atlanta United team who doesn't play good and they're getting results and they're beating a team <laughs> and, and they're beating a team in Orlando City who has has been so you the biggest the disappointment the biggest disappointment so you watched the whole season. game so you watched yeah. the whole game no I didn't <laughs> the one, no. I the point to make do not playing good but still getting results all I had to no, see all I had to watch was 10 minutes of you guys and it's, it's oh, okay like, that's I, good that's good I, analysis. I, take that take when I woke up, when I woke up from my CBS nap. and say, I watch 10 minutes of games and I can give you guys exactly what's going to happen. I watched the first 10 minutes and then when I woke up from my nap, you guys were up 2-0. It was, it was kind of weird. <laughs> Listen, if we're this not is playing, gone. This has gone off the rails. If we're not playing at our maximum level right now, which I would agree we're not playing. Oh, at our so you agree. Level. No, I don't agree that we're not playing well. I don't agree that we're playing at our absolute best, but we're still getting results and we're still That's grinding great. out games. And this is exactly what I want to see out of a team early in the season who's not playing great. We're able to still get results. And guess well, what? That's our, a our hallmark best, of a good team. I just said are, it. Are playing well. Giacomakis, our striker, is just on fire. Gaku, Gaku, <laughs> did he get one? What do you think about what do you think about the Chicago Fire? Oh and my gosh. 
Did you see that? And thing? they're they're getting the results. Um, do they feel as good <laughs> as you guys do about getting early results early in the season? I don't think they can feel great about that game. That was just four to amazing. four to that three. Was Kyle 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 what Kyle minute was that? Chaos. Ninety ninth minute. Yeah, ninety ninth minute. Kuipers gets his first goal. Their DP gets a goal in the ninety third to to tie it. Right to go three three. They were down three to one. Yep, they I were down know. three one in the eighty second minute. So I come got- back. That's a Goonie. That's a Goonies win right there, baby. That is a Goonies win. But I, I what I wanted to focus on, and which is great. I mean, Did that, that it? does boost morale. It changes a, a lot. It can change a lot. Doesn't necessarily change a lot, but can I mean, change a lot in terms of the Montreal complexion. Montreal had especially. two PKs in the first in the first half. Both yeah. questionable. Very questionable calls, by the way. If we're going to talk about but refs in this segment, what I yeah, what I wanted to touch on was Courtois' comments after the game because he, along with quite a few others, went after the replacement referees. Are, Rightfully are we, so, guards. Are we at a tipping point or are we past that point? Dex, do you have the comments? I got them. Give them. Give them. the con- give. Give it, give it in your best uh, French. I wish I could. I I, I, don't, please, want, I don't want to please. embarrass myself, and I don't come want my French. I got a couple of French teammates. They uh, I don't want them to come after me. Um, he essentially this article is saying he saw the game as a robbery, which is not his words, but he said twenty two minutes of added time, a red card on their goalkeeper that wasn't given, uh, throw ins where their players were coming onto the pitch. On one of the goals, it wasn't even a corner kick. The first goal we conceded was offside. It all adds up. Usually, I always take the blame, but you still have to realize that the match was affected by external elements. Something was taken away from my guys, and it's hard to swallow under these conditions. They worked too hard for this. Boom. Gordo, I know you've heard those comments from a coach a million times, as have I, because they're they get to a point where they're frustrated, right? But I know that we've also watched the first four weeks of MLS. We heard Garber say the other day that they're willing to go the distance with this issue with the referees. At what point do you need to trust the product on the field in telling you that this isn't good enough any longer? Right now, right now, is it right now? I'm, right now. I've I've always I've I've always been a strong believer that for for many years, and I think that over the past ten years, refereeing in MLS has gotten substantially better. Okay. Dramatically doing, improved. Dram- I would dramatically agree. improved. Okay. So they were on their way to fixing this, which helps the product on the field. And now we have a league with such, such great talent. And we talk about it time and time again. These games are getting really fun to watch. It's got a lot of quality. It's got a lot of these things. And now you've, you've, you've shot yourself in the foot. You're going backwards again because the, the quality on the field is is suffering. It's suffering. Mm-hmm. It's suffering on a massive level, and it's it's easy to see. There are twenty two minutes of stoppage time. In which world should that ever be a thing? Unless somebody has a heart attack on the field or something, you know that that's just it's absurd. It is I, absurd. I, I think I commented on this because it was the, the first time that I had seen this was in <clears throat> the World Cup um, in in cutter when they were ha- all of a sudden every game had 10 to 14 minutes of stoppage time and it became mini games inside of a game and every team played it differently and, and it completely changed the excitement of the game too in a lot of positive ways but definitely a lot of negatives as well but that i would agree with you is is insane that is insanity the these players i think soccer players in general are are built to withstand suffering. So we are bred to be able to suffer as long as possible. Right? Journeymen absolutely and, are built. <laughs> journeymen for sure. Uh, maybe not the number 10s. Maybe they're not put on the same standard. But I think in general, you're just, you learn how to cope and you learn how to deal with different variables within a game. It seems like they've reached their limit. And and the fact that it's now trickling out into the media, I, at some point, Don has to address it. The league has to address it. Have we had any clarity on what the gulf is in between these two things? Are there, it is just a standoff that's in the I'm worst like. way possible. That's what it looks like. We need these guys to get back to the table. Come on. 
come on, guys, listen to the Journeyman podcast. Let's make some sacrifices on both sides and let's get back out there. The only thing I'll say about the refs is I think it's, I, I you know, I, we would have to have a ref on here to actually give a little context, but I feel like mm-hmm. refing in some ways could be like, could be like playing it a little bit, right? Like the higher level you get, the more consistent you get, like the more games you have under your belt, tenure, higher level game, you get more consistent. Any referee potentially could step on an MLS field and on a one-off occasion or two-off occasion have a good game. And, you know, the league could look at that and say, these guys are doing a great job. Once you start to add up game after game after game, high-level game, high-level game, and there's not a consistency here, you're not seeing a consistent improvement. You're seeing more of like up and down, and it's actually starting to get worse, which is in my, how I interpret some comments from players, some comments from coaches, just in general what I've seen, like what I saw even in our game uh, last night against Orlando City. It's just the, some sometimes the level just gets too much for these guys. And, and it just mm-hmm. is getting too high for them. And you're not seeing the consistency that you would see from, I think, a pro referee. So, yeah, the consistency just, is not there. Just say, ref, just say yes, refs, like the players have been doing for 28 years. You're not, <laughs> you're, you're not going to beat Barber. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, my gosh. I, I don't know, man. It just seems like – it seems to me that the league is – is is missing the mark on an opportunity to take real feedback from its players and its coaches and and the real experts in the room today like i'm i'm dax you're you're still an expert in the room i'm no longer the expert that i once was in terms of being on a field every single day watching and feeling the game being a part of the game when this is getting managed and i think to your point about it getting to a point where it's it's too much. It's too much to take it all in. There are so many little details and little things that happen within the ecosystem of a game that, to your point, Gordo, that these referees have gotten so much better at managing. But the stakes are too high at this point. Like, there's not, it, we're not talking about allowing junior level, academy level referees come out and, and be with the first team game in, game out, right? Like, People any of jobs, those players. Dark. Any People right, any of those players jobs. get sent to the bench. Like nobody does that. But now there's there's no opportunity. So will the league pick up a couple referees that that maybe can hack it? For sure. Are they able to point to a couple more of these referees exactly. that are like, oh, you know what? They have the chops. They can get it in. But that's also probably points to a bigger problem, as in like, when are they bringing these refs up to give them a piece and give them an opportunity to showcase what they they do? It's got to get figured out, and it's got to get figured out yesterday. It's it's gotten to a point now where you're going to start really affecting the trajectory of this season, if not already, and, if it and, goes on and, any longer. And I, I, like, I don't want to keep talking about this. I don't want to look at like a post-game recap and all I see is just comments about refereeing, right? Because that's the easy mm-hmm. thing. That's the easy thing for, for players and coaches to talk about now. And it's easy excuses. And maybe some of it is justified, right? But like, come on, let's get back to pissing and moaning about what a handball is. I think it it also diminishes where Garber is at in saying that this is the league of choice, right? Uh, uh, you're you're not far away from that. You spend the entire year saying that we have terrible referees. It hurts the product. It hurts the delivery. It hurts all the talking points. It's a lot. It's it's an inflection point that's too too big to miss. Before we uh, before you get us out of here, guards, can I give a a shout out to a former Atlanta United player, Mister uh, yeah. Matias yeah. Rosetto? Thank Ooh. you. Thank you for letting me wear your suit for this uh that you left in the locker room for our team walk we had again through the fan. <laughs> it fit me actually better than the one that they tailored for me. So I felt way more confident. I felt way better walking in my Good. suit. All the boys in the locker room were like, oh, a nice suit. You get a tailor? I'm like, nope, this is not my suit. And uh I may claim it. I may claim it. So thank you, Mateus. I don't know why you wouldn't at this point. I actually thought he was a lot taller than you. He liked to wear his stuff pretty tight, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he had those three-quarter leg style, huh? <laughs> yeah, it fits me great. He liked his ankles exposed a little bit. <laughs> ankles exposed. Good. Well, hey, listen, nice work on the pod today, gentlemen. For those journeymen that are tuning in, we appreciate it. We'll see you out there soon again. <laughs>